With NVIDIA in the rearview mirror, investors staring straight ahead at the next big inflation report. Live from Studio 2 here at Bloomberg headquarters in New York, I'm Romaine Boston. And I'm Alex Steele. Nice to see you, by the way. Nice to see you, too. So you know the thing I learned last no. week? what did you learn? Is that nothing changes. Is that the market still doesn't <laughs> want to go down. This is my takeaway from last week, where we counted down into the close right here in the U.S. So to my point, I appreciate the fact the S&P is off two-tenths of one percent, but volume's a little bit mixed. But it's hard to get a sustained downward move. I was really struck by that, no matter what headline crossed uh, last week. I did want to point out, though, some fun stuff going on here. Altice is up a whopping 41 percent. Charter Communications down by about two. Uh, the rumor mill has it that Charter might be making a bid for Altice. Uh, Charter's losing uh, customers as people cut the cord and all tease well they have the customer so there you go a uh, seven year yield seven i know it's weird but i did seven because that's the auction coming tomorrow you had the two and the fives today um it was a mixed bag the two was a little light the five came in nice and strong uh, and bitcoin hitting the highest level uh in about two two or three years i mean talk about some weird mix of animal spirits there romaine but my big takeaway stocks do not want to go down period all right, well, we see a big day for Bitcoin there. It's going to be a big week for Treasury auctions, a big week for economic data as well, with the post-NVIDIA hangover really taking over this market right now, a market really looking to catch its breath and reassess whether that phenomenal stock market rally off of those October lows has finally run its course. Professional money managers offloading positions for four straight sessions last week with a selling intensity ranking in the 98th percentile of the past five years. That's according to data out of Goldman's prime brokerage unit, data that suggests traders are booking profits and rotating into less volatile stocks. You take companies that make household products, for example. They saw the most net buying in 10 weeks, and we're going to get an added assessment of that profit landscape with tech earnings from names like Zoom, Salesforce, and HP this week, as well as retail earnings from names like Macy's, TJX as well as AutoZone. A number of forecasters have already looked at the earnings season so far and raised their price targets. HSBC strategists, they upgraded global stocks to neutral, saying their decision to downgrade to underweight just back in January, they failed to predict the rally in artificial intelligence stocks. They now say that rally could continue and to stay focused on tech, healthcare, and selected discretionary names with strong earnings growth. But strategists over at JP Morgan Securities urge a bit of caution, saying profit margins might actually be peaking and the strategists over at Goldman, they say any improvement in market sentiment from this point forward is going to require a bit more material rotation out of cash, as well as better macroeconomic conditions to support it. And that brings us to the big data point for the week, the Core Personal Consumption Expenditures Price Index. Alex, that's a fancy way of saying that this is the Fed's favorite inflation gauge. <laughs> it drops on Thursday, and it's expected to be higher than what it was the month before. You know it's going to be a soft day Monday when you're already anticipating Thursday. <laughs> like, you know, that's that's the drill. All right, so here's what everyone's going to be worried about. So uh, the yellow line is core PPI, and then the white line is, is core PCE, the blue line, core CPI. Did you get that? So basically, here's the blue line. That's core uh, CPI. You saw that at 3.9%, right? We were expected it to go down. It did not. It accelerated a little bit. Now, core PPI, yeah, the trajectory is still lower, but again, it surprised to the upside. And the question is, will this line, this nice white line, which is the core PCE, will that surprise uh, to the upside? Do you look through it? You say, okay, the trajectory is still 2%. These are kind of temporary factors or one-off factors, therefore take it in stride. Or will this be a market moving event if we get that hotter than expected uh, PCE remain? Absolutely. Let's kick things off here on this Monday afternoon with Jordan Jackson, global market strategist over at J.P. Morgan Investment Management, helping us count down to the close uh, here on this Monday afternoon. And Jordan, we start this week coming off of what has been a pretty scintillating rally to start the year. Of course, that was bolstered last week by the earnings that we got out of NVIDIA. And while we might see a little bit of a profit taking here on this Monday, do you have any sense here that market sentiment still points this market further to the upside? Uh, I think there is further upside, and, and I'm actually pretty bullish. Um, obviously, the markets are keenly focused on the micro, uh, really to kick off the year. And you look no further, uh, the fact that the U.S. tenure is up close to 40 basis points and the market has grinded higher. So clearly, the markets are focused on earnings. Uh, the big names in the index are delivering in earnings, on earnings uh, for, for the most part. And I think now markets are hoping for a bit of a more breath, right, broadening out. That's what we uh, continue to talk about. And I think we will see that play out uh, this year. 
uh, the consumer remains strong and, and continues to spend. Uh, I also think that uh, moving on later on this year, there's going to be a pretty supportive macro, macro backdrop uh, with the Fed beginning to ease up on, on policy. So I think there's still a little bit more juice left uh, in this rally. Before we get to some of that macro uh, data, Jordan, I am curious with regards to earnings, because there was so much focus coming into this year about how tech was going to hold everything up. And so far, tech definitely did its job. But when you look outside of the tech sector, was there anything there in those earnings, those non-tech earnings, that gave you some more confidence? Yes, uh, and it's really actually some of the more unloved sectors. I I'm really focusing in on the forward guidance uh, that companies are, are putting forth. And when you look at sectors uh, like energy, for an example, even real estate, consumer staples, uh, these are sectors where you have over 50 percent, so the majority of companies in these sectors that are posting positive uh, forward guidance for 2024. And so, you know, uh, when you look at sort of baseline relative to analyst expectations, improving forward guidance is a good sign that these companies are, are pretty positive on, on the, back, on the backdrop, uh, macro backdrop. So um, I think, you know, looking at other, else, other places um, could, be, could be advantageous for investors, not just in, in the tech sector. Hey, Jordan, I understand the whole broadening the rally thing. What, what I find so interesting about that conversation is that if you ask anyone, they all have different answers. Like some are like, yeah, we've totally been broadening. Just look at healthcare hit a record high. Uh, excuse me. Yeah, healthcare in the S&P hit a record high on Friday versus nope, just look at how many uh, stocks in the S&P are over a certain moving average. We're not broadening. How do I know what to look at? Well, I think you look at the, the, the whole gambit. Um, a lot of times what we, tend to, what we tend to look at is uh, breaking out the top 10 versus uh, the, rest of, the rest of the index. The other call it 495. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you go back to really back to early 2023, um, the top 10 names of the index are up over 80%. Uh, whereas the other 495 are roughly low double digits uh, from a total return standpoint. So we'd like to see the other, call it 495, play uh, a little bit of catch up. And in our view, that's the idea of, of what we mean when we say broadening out, right? Other mm -hmm. sectors that are, that are performing. I know some people tend to look at it from a market cap perspective, right? When are we going to see small caps finally start to play a little bit of a catch up? But we tend to kind of look, focus a little bit more on the large cap space and really look at sector breadth in terms of performance. But Romain, it can also sometimes look like a Rorschach test. Yes, absolutely. Like, see what you want to when uh, you want to see it absolutely. Uh, at the end of the day. Um, hey, Jordan, I, I, we started the segment kind of talking about PCE and where we are on Thursday. What's the likelihood that that's going to burst something? Uh, I don't think it's going to burst something. The, the Fed has continuously talked about wanting to see uh, a trend in the data, and a trend we know is now roughly three months or so, and, and January is going to be, I think, a bit of an outlier. And when you look at the labor market statistics, obviously, uh, at, at the surface level, very, very strong a BLS employment report for January, but we have to remember there's a lot of seasonal adjustments that go into, uh, that happen at the beginning of the year. So I would take some of the data uh, with a grain of salt. I do think some of the inflation numbers that we've seen so far in January suggest maybe a bit of a bump uh, in the road, but I still don't think that this is a uh, worrisome longer term uh, trend that inflation, that the disinflation trend is no longer on track. We're still in the camp that inflation should continue to move lower and hit 2% uh, by the end of the year, but it could be a bit of a, a bumpy road. And that gives uh, that give you more confidence in the story that we've heard from a lot of folks on the fixed income side, Jordan, this idea that it's finally safer to extend duration in the bond market. Well, you know, I've been, I've been a little bit cautious early on. One of the things that I was cautious about in terms of extending duration was the market still had a lot of work to do in terms of pricing out uh, all those rate cuts. We came into the year expecting six cuts. Now we're finally back down to somewhere between three to four. Uh, that looks, uh, feels a, a little bit more right uh, in, in my view. I will say, though, I've been cautioning investors not to have a one-year outlook on rates, but to really have a two- to three-year outlook on rates because, you know, the reality is the inflation, it could be a bumpy ride down to 2%. Um, obviously, ec economic growth remains strong, and there is the concern that if you have growth that remains above trend, that potentially stokes increased aggregate demand, and you could see some demand-driven inflation in the economy uh, as well, particularly if labor markets remain as tight as they are and wage inflation, uh, real wage growth remains positive here over the next couple, uh, the next couple of months. And so having a two-year outlook, though, on rates, you can yeah. feel confident that the Fed is going to have cut rates uh, we can argue till we're blue in the face in terms of how many times they cut rates. But inflation is likely going to have normalized and growth is going to have stepped down when we look ahead towards 2025. And so I feel pretty confident uh, that rates will be lower over a two-year horizon, maybe a little bit less so over a, a three- to six-month horizon. All right. Going to have to leave it there. Always smart, Jordan. 
Uh, Jordan, Game 6, Jackson there, global market strategist over at J.P. Morgan Investment Management, helping us kick off to the close here on this Monday afternoon with a closer focus in just a second on Kroger and Albertsons, that $24 billion deal running into resistance. We're going to take a look at why the U.S. FTC and eight states want to block the combination of the two largest supermarket chains in the country. All right, plus, speaking of, our stock of the hour is Altice. Bloomberg learning that Charter Communications is exploring a takeover, sending shares just soaring. We're going to take a closer look at that. And a big week for retailers and earnings. Macy's, Lowe's, TJX, just some of the big names set to report this week. A preview of what to watch and all of those results. All that and more coming up in just a bit. This is The Close on Bloomberg. I would only buy an EV if it had a baguette holder. Said no one ever. Yet, however, that's one of the things that's coming out of the Geneva car show. There is a lot of high-end stuff and high-end tech uh, that we're looking at. Renault is trying to woo some people with a baguette holder as well as lower-priced EVs with their R5 E tech city car. You also have BYD is pitching a floating, apparently, luxury SUV. GM wants to hook up with some luxurious uh, European retailers for their EVs. Well, Bloomberg's Detroit Bureau Chief David Welch joins us now. David, help me cut through the noise on this one. What is all this really about? <laughs> It's about giving luxury buyers new options, uh, new ways to bring them in because the competition's really fierce. Uh, you know, you look at what Cadillac is trying to do with aligning themselves up with luxury brands in Europe. I, I think maybe because Cadillac hasn't really been had a big presence in the European market for a very long time, that they're trying to give European luxury buyers some sort of identity and, and, and a reason to like American luxury. They, they don't buy American luxury cars from anybody. So, uh, you know, everybody is looking for some sort of new lure because the EV market, it's all expensive vehicles and, and it's really tough, really tough uh, competition right now. I am curious, though, but on the luxury side, David, particularly when it comes to American luxury vehicles in those foreign markets, particularly Europe, do American luxury vehicles stack up, at least in terms of the perception amongst consumers? There's not much of a perception among consumers for American luxury vehicles. I, I, if you, probably if you, if you ask most luxury buyers in Europe right now, they would see the high-end Teslas as an American luxury car over there because hmm. they're priced that way. Cadillac has had a presence there, and, and, and they've sold some of their vehicles even after General Motors left Europe, but it was very small amounts. It's really tough to penetrate the European luxury market, yeah. which is dominated by German luxury. Toyota's had a tough time. Lexus does volume over there, but it, it's not like they're not as competitive in Europe as they are in the U.S. It, it's just a very, very tough market to crack, particularly in Germany, because the buyers tend to be a bit nationalistic when it comes to luxury. But Cadillac mm -hmm. doesn't have a great brand image. Or, uh, I'd say not great awareness. People, a lot of buyers probably don't really know what it is or what it stands for at There's this point. Other, so GM's going to have work to do to figure that out. I mean, sorry, we were just looking at the picture of this bag, holder, which I'm a little confused. So that it's a gets, basket. That will get attention. It's a right? So wouldn't yeah, that yeah. just leave crumbs everywhere every time you, you put your bread well, in there? My assumption, and is the bread not wrapped in something already? Well, my assumption is that the half of the baguette is probably wrapped, but then you have a basket so it gets some fresh air rather than putting in a cup holder. Does bread need that? Yeah. Okay. I, I mean, I don't know. I'm just trying to figure out who would buy it based on a bread basket. But I think the point is that oh. EVs are hard to sell right now. The first adopters have yeah. gotten in. Where do you put the butter, though? I don't know. That's a really good question. Do they have a butter holder? Because that know. could be key. I mean, David, does all of this just speak to the fact that the first mover advantage EVs guys have had their day? Like, if I wanted one, I would have bought one yesterday. It's about getting the regular people like me and Romaine to buy one that proves to be the problem. It is. Although, with, with the luxury EVs, higher-end cars. It's about getting the next purchase. And there are still some people out there who haven't bought it. But to really penetrate the mass market, it's, it's not going to be about baguette holders. And if there's, say, Louis Vuitton no. stitching in your next electric Cadillac, no. it's about bringing the prices down and the driving range, yeah. how long you can go on a charge, bringing that up. So somebody who has one car in their garage and not three or four will buy the vehicle. And don't forget also 
a car that can float on water, David. I mean, we have to have our priorities. It just can't be all be about price and you know range. I mean, let's be honest. That's, it, that's ridiculous. If it floated on water, I would <laughs> definitely not the first buy to it. Do that. <laughs> <laughs> let's be very. They, clear. they are. They are not. Uh, David, going to have to leave it there. Still, always fascinating to see the gimmicks rolled out at these auto shows. David Welch, our Detroit bureau chief, a closer look. Some of the vehicles, Alex. One, of course, that you are definitely into the Renault with the. Uh, bread basket. But it's also like $27,000. Uh, okay, well, that's cheaper than that's a lot, a lot cheaper than the, US. the BYD. They, they come without a bread with basket. With the fancy one of yeah. $233,000. So that's like. Right now, I just put my bread in the seat next to me. Right, like, no, like a, crumbs. Like a Cretan. Yeah. Crumbs. Basket. Yeah, what can I say? All right, coming up here, a closer look at some of the other big stocks moving, including Zoom. Those uh, That company is scheduled to report results after the bell tonight. A breakdown of what investors, well, what they should watch from the release. That's coming up next. This is the close on Bloomberg. All right, let's get a view from the sell side with our top calls, the big movers on the back of analyst recommendations. And we start off with Amer Sports, the maker of Wilson Rackets and other sports equipment. Remember, it went public just last month, now generating mostly buy recommendations from analysts starting coverage of the stock. Over at Bernstein, Melinda Hu says Amer is well positioned for strong growth and highlights the growing appeal of the company's Arcteryx snowwear brand as a fashion symbol over there in China. Shares getting a decent bid on the day, up about 3%. Next up, let's take a look at Gap. JP Morgan lifting its rating to neutral from underweight. The analyst over there says recent data checks point to stability at the Old Navy and the Gap stores brand specifically with right size inventory levels. He also sees opportunity for Gap's athleta brand in the second half of the year as new leadership adjusts the performance strategy. Gap shares, though, unchanged on the day. And finally, let's take a look at Moderna. Getting cut to reduce from hold over at HSBC with the puff of that COVID-19 vaccine fizzling out for the company. The analyst citing lingering uncertainty to Moderna's revenue. They also flag concern over Moderna's RSV vaccine after recent data suggests efficacy waning faster than its competitors. Those shares down about 3% on the day, and those are some of our top calls. All right, let's stay in the sell side space and move on to Zoom. That company is out with its results after the bell tonight. Annual sale, sales growth expected to slightly tick up by about 1%. Though analysts will be watching whether the company's expanded products can actually contribute to more and better growth. Joining us right now is Peter Levine, enterprise software analyst over at Evercore ISI. He has an inline recommendation on the shares. All right, Peter, uh, we're looking what something like a billion dollars in revenue for the most recent quarter. EPS of about a dollar or so per share here. Is this a growth story or is this just kind of uh, maintaining what they already have? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Thanks for having me. It's yeah. You know, I'm sure they would love to return to more of a growth story, but I think it's maintaining what they have. You know, I think expectations for the quarter, 1% growth, you know, the, the bar is pretty low. I think I think what investors are going to be looking for is, is there a line of sight to actual revenue growth into next year, which is their fiscal 25 quarter? So I think the focus this quarter will be what their guide and a sense of is there, you know, reacceleration of the top line. One thing that like a lot of people are concerned about, Peter, this is a company that started primarily as a consumer facing product. In order to achieve both growth and profitability, they made a big pivot towards enterprise customers, corporate customers. But as we've seen from other software companies, IT services companies, there has been a pullback in corporate spending. Are we going to hear about that in this report and conference call tonight? I think we will, but it sounds from their prior commentary like we're closer to a trough, meaning if it's not this quarter, it's next. So a lot of the COVID deals that they signed back in 2020-21, like that came up for renewal in 24. And as we saw with the layoffs, you know, most of the headwinds that they had to deal with customers downselling their contracts, for the most part, is behind us. So I think investors will be looking for net retention, which is, you know, the metric that would indicate that, you know, spending on the enterprise side is, has stabilized and there is an inflection point higher to your point earlier around a lot of the newer products, phone, collaboration and contact center gain a little bit more momentum. So, Peter, I guess what I'm trying to understand is what is that worth to the stock? Because if you just look at a four year chart, it's been pretty much dead in the water since 2022 when the pandemic kind of was over and we went back to the office. So a little bit of growth, a little bit better, then we get the trough. But what does that actually mean to the equity price? You know, I, you know, the price you would, you know, I would like to think it's, you know, it, it's out of floor in terms of valuation, mm -hmm. but in terms of a catalyst, it, it's still somewhat lacking. 
I think what investors, you know, the ones that, you know, are a little bit more bullish on the stock seem that they're they're moving to contact center, which is, you know, a massive $20 billion market, what they're doing on the phone side on um, collaboration. Um, but again, at four and a half billion dollars in revenue, it's it's tough to move the top line. So I think yeah. investors will also be looking for, you know, they're sitting on six and a half billion in cash. They have equity. You know, uh, you know, the expectation is, is are they going to go out and buy, you know, start buying some in, uh, inorganic acquisitions or some assets to accelerate the top line? So I think what they're doing, I think it's commensurate to kind of the TAM opportunity. But investors will be focused on, you know, how are they going to deploy that cash to accelerate the top line? So, Peter, at this point, who's a pure play competitor with Zoom and who is just a competitor but has other businesses like a Microsoft Teams or something? You know, I, I mean, I think at this point, you know, it is Microsoft Teams and Zoom have basically come on, they have taken over this market. You know, there's a lot of players like a, like a Ring Central that does phone that are trying, every vendor that they used to compete with is now trying to move into contact center. Um, so there's a lot of point solutions out that they compete with. But the question is, is do they need their technology at this point? I mean, that's, they've done a really good job of scaling to one example is their phone business. Like it's, you know, where it was three years ago to where it is today is very impressive. But again, I think the focus is on, you know, how that contact center business matures. But in terms of competition, it's really this them and Microsoft. And in terms of where the greenfield opportunity comes from, you know, they're still replacing a lot of like the legacy Cisco WebEx users. So there's a little tiny like greenfield left for them but really is, is the angle is it's just the new avenues around collaboration, contact mm -hmm. center, and scaling that phone market up market to the enterprise side. All right, Peter, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Peter Levine joining us over at Thank Evercore uh, ISI. I mean, it's tough when like your main competitor is Microsoft Teams. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, well, that, that's I mean, a whole other conversation between uh, the behemoth that Microsoft is and the quality of the products. But that we, is we an excellent have, point. We can have that conversation. It's a different day, conversation. And I don't get myself in trouble on air. <laughs> but. But, but it was, I mean, you think about the ease of use, right? Because mm -hmm. what Zoom was, th their product wasn't new or novel. I mean, Cisco had a great product, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. a great product. They had a product, Google, uh, but uh, Google mm -hmm. as well. But it, there was a certain ease of use, certainly from the custom customer side. And I thought the way they were integrated into a lot of the enterprise, uh, uh, enterprise customers, they did a good job at that as well. But that appears to be waning. And you are seeing more people gravitate back to Microsoft Teams because let's face it, if you're already buying a suite of Microsoft products, you might as well just fold Teams right in there. Same thing with Google Suite or even something like Cisco. Oh, I remember this is, back in yeah. the, this is back in the day in 2020 that it was like the stocks to watch were DocuSign and Zoom. Yeah. And when those tank, the pandemic's over. Yeah. And we just saw DocuSign sort of fall out of bed too. It just feels like, and they're not going to go out of business, no, right? No. Like they, they have a good product. They're solid. Right. But in terms of like depending on that for our survival, it's, it's you don't need it anymore in the same way. Yeah, but this stock has just come such a long way from the early days oh of the pandemic. Gosh, when, uh, what was it? 568 bucks in uh, October of 2020. And now mm -hmm. we're down around six or three bucks here. So maybe there is a growth story, yeah. story there, Alex. Or, or maybe. We'll have to find it. Yep. All right, well, coming up, talk about growth. We'll get a preview of what to watch in this week's big retail earnings. Macy's coming up next. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Just about 3.30 p.m. here in New York. This is the countdown to the close. I'm Romaine Bostic. And I'm Alex Steele. So as I was saying earlier, I was out last week, right? Yes. And what I learned is that stocks don't want to go down. Okay. But what did I, what did I miss about Walmart? What did you... <laughs> what did you miss about Walmart? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they had a great quarter. They had Scarlett. a great quarter. Yes, they also are going to buy Vizio, not necessarily for the TV, but apparently for all the yes. data and mm -hmm. software behind that. Uh, so you missed a lot, Alex. I did miss a lot. But and, I, and, and you'd you be can. surprised. Stocks actually did go down at some point last week. They just ended up going I know, up. but then you just buy the dip anyway. It's not like a sustained downdraft. And I say this because I am here for the week that I really care about, which is TJX okay. and Macy's. Okay. Uh, I, do you know this about my shopping, that yeah, I only shop like on sale? Yeah, you like the sales of TJX. Not, well, not my big thing. No, no, but also, like, I'll go to Bloomies yeah. for good sales. The Bloomies, But, okay. like, where I'm yeah. shopping, you should probably That's a little short. more structured. Yes. You know, things are orderly. You have a salesperson. Okay, the TJ like Maxx that. isn't, so, like, a know. rummage bin that you're, yeah, like, throwing Max clothes. Just, yeah, you're, like, Scrooge McDuck <laughs> jumping into the thing there. Okay, it's not like that at all. But we're going to get a picture of those 
those names. You got Best Buy, you got Lowe's, TJX, and Macy's. All those earnings uh, are rolling out over the next couple days. You also get the Conference Board's Consumer Confidence Index. Uh, that's coming out tomorrow as well. Uh, joining us now is Sharon Martis, who's Director of Consumer Research for the London Stock Exchange Group. Really great to get your perspective. My joke is that if I'm shopping there, you should short the stock because I'm only yeah. shopping on sales. So this is like the, the fun little Alex indicator that we have. What I are we like going to learn about that from Macy's and TJX? Well, without a doubt, it was a very jolly holiday season for the retailers. When we look at the, at the overall numbers, um, retailers are beating estimates, over 70% of them are, and earnings are expected to grow 33% for retailers. Sales were up nearly 5%, according to our LSAC data. And obviously, all the shopping you did at TJX definitely helped them because they're expected to post a robust uh, number, 4.2% same-store sales, stronger than Ross. That's because also they have their home goods division, which consumers really loved and was a favorite. Um, another favorite this week is uh, Macy's, uh, the department stores, because they had such a strong holiday se season. Their inventory levels are actually very much lean mm -hmm. going into the first quarter. Uh, we're also looking... Well, that means no sales for me, right? No, I'm so sorry. In <laughs> fact, the average promotional rate and average discount has gone down for the month of February mm -hmm. and might actually even decrease even further in the month of March. Easter's coming earlier. And as you know, um, for a very long time, we haven't had a must-have fashion item, right? Mm -hmm. But this year, things have changed. So, uh, Romaine, I'm not sure if you're into wide pants. Wide <laughs> pants? Yes. Okay. But analysts, <laughs> analysts right. are actually yeah. bullish that this, this might actually uh, boost sales at the apparel. and For men and women? Or just for men, men and women, yes. Uh, so we're talking like total wide leg. Yes, the wider wide the better. Down. So this is like the little sailor pants or something like that? Yes. Okay. Uh, interesting. I, yeah. I may have to pass on that. Okay. I mean, I'm... I don't I'm, think, I'm not quite it. skinny jeans, uh, uh, wood, <laughs> but I don't know, wide pants might be a little bit too much. You feel like medium size? What, <laughs> medium <laughs> size. But what, what, is there going to be a difference, though, that we see yeah. between the higher end consumer and the proverbial lower end consumer? Or is that sort of, or those lines have been blurred? So all the reports show that the high end consumer is still very much engaged. Mm -hmm. Even the aspirational consumer, um, the consumer is still gainfully employed. Unemployment rate is very low, and therefore they're still spending. Uh, TJ Axe especially got a boost from the aspirational consumer that still want designer clothing, but for less. So that consumer is still shopping. The dollar stores are also expected to do well this week. They're yeah. receiving um, a boost from the low end consumer that's just sticking to those staples, though. Well, well, what about, though, the department stores like a Macy's, Bloomingdale's, which also owned by them as well, Nordstrom? Are they sort of affected by the idea that we are going more, the proverbial eye, not a me, yeah. but that we're all going to a TJX or a Ross stores or something like that? Macy's so far, no. So the holiday season yeah. was strong, right? We had a very strong holiday season, earnings growth of 33%, but those are already expected to drop to 12.9% for the first quarter. To date, we've been receiving more negative negative guidance from retailers. We've received 18 negative pre-announcements yeah. and only two positive. Wow. So that tells you that the negative to positive uh, ratio is not favorable. This is also in line with our latest consumer confidence report that tells us that the consumers for the first time um, are concerned about their job security. So they were a little bit spooked about all the layoffs that, that we saw in the tech sector about a month ago. and. Um, if this number, the unemployment number, is to go above the 4% mark, well, that's when we can see consumer spending hold back a little. So is there pent-up demand, though, for that? Like, if you hold back your spending because you're worried, but then those fears don't come to fruition, is there a pent-up move? So in general, when we look at where the strength is for the remainder of the year, consumers, when they open up their wallets, that will still be at the services. They're still going to go traveling. They're going to spend it at restaurants, eating out, and looking at entertainment. That's where the money is expected to continue to be spent. In terms of pent-up demand, that might happen at a retailer or apparel department store that might have those wider pants when you have a new trend coming in. I see. So that's when you, that's a wide pants. You, you own a pair of these wide pants? I have a pair. Of, so I buy my jeans from this designer in Paris and oh, I mean, wow. I know it sounds super fancy, okay. but it's not. They, 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 they get them like super cheap for like 34 euros. But yeah, they have like the wide yeah. leg. Yeah. Well, Scarlet's they're coming really back. into it too. Wide, yes. You know, I got invited to a party that it, you had to wear either fur or, or oh. animal print. Which one did you choose? I own neither. So, uh, so I told them I can't go. <laughs> what? No, you yeah, should definitely buy it's one. It's party. Was I mean, this just you no, not wanting to no go to the Paris party? jeans there. I mean, you know, uh, what can I say? I have a lot of solid color suits in my, in my wardrobe. <laughs> um, what, what is the correlation do you think to Around, and this is a silly question, but the stock market. Like yes. The stock market's not the economy, right? 
Right. But if we have some kind of, you know, record high after record high after record high, is there a confidence read through yes. spending? Yes. So absolutely. When you look at the consumer confidence, we do have one particular index, one component that actually has improved and has become more positive. And that is the consumer's expectations about the future. They've seen that the stock market is being healthy and they actually do believe that things could change for the positive because it's an election year. So things could change and therefore the expectation index has actually been improving in a time when the job index has come down. So that balances it out. And, and any concern, though, about that shift to services, the idea that more people were spending more of their disposable income, say, on services rather than, right. say, you know, buying a new pair of wide pants or whatever fancy jeans <laughs> Alex has shipped in from Paris over there. Well, yeah. so, so far, uh, the projections for actually March uh, retail sales are expected to be strong, and that's because the weeks leading to Easter will be strong. Mm -hmm. um, we did see a week. January retail sales, we could expect to see the same thing in February, mm -hmm. but all of the reports, all of the analysts uh, polled by LSAC do suggest that that is going to definitely pick up in March because the consumer is still um, employed, unemployment is still low, the stock market is healthy, and also because of that new trend coming in. And generally, the weeks leading into um, Easter, that's when we see a refresh into the new merchandise and new fashion for consumers. So it's expected to be positive and strong this March. It's a big holiday for hats as well. Yes. There was like a publicly Actually, traded hat for hats. Oh, I'd be all I in I can't that, do hats. So, yeah. I'm not allowed to wear hats. Why not? Uh, yeah. I look really bad in hats. No. Even a fedora hat? Even my nine-year-old's like, mommy, take it off. Oh, no. Hat. Yeah, but the white leg pants, I'm all in on that. Okay. <laughs> all right, Jerome Martis is there, Director of Consumer Research over at LSA. A closer look here at some of the big retail reports we're expected to get this week and next. Uh, and Alex, I, I don't know if we have time to talk about this, but I'm really intrigued uh, by this uh, supplier you have in Paris of these not fancy jeans, according to They're you. not fancy. Yeah. I get them for like 30 euros, and they're really good, and they fit. It's very hard when you're short to get pants that fit. Okay. Right. I'll leave you with that. All right. We can talk in break. <laughs> All right. Coming up here, a closer look at some of the other big movers of the day, including a big Bloomberg scoop here, learning that Charter Communications is exploring a takeover of cable provider Altice. We're going to send those shares uh, moving higher here on the day. Altice USA up almost 53%. That's our stock of the hour, and it's coming up next. This is The Close on Bloomberg. It's time now for our stock of the hour, and it's a big one. Shares of Altice right now soaring more than 50% on the back of that news that Charter Communications is exploring a takeover of the cable provider. Abigail Doolittle joining us right now to talk a little bit more about this. And we should just point out, this is according to people familiar with the situation. The companies have not confirmed or denied what's going on. But the reporting right now is that these two companies would tie up. It says Altice has, what, about 5 million or so uh, customers. How many customers does Charter have? What are we looking at in total? It would be the biggest broadband company if they came together together with a thir about 35 uh, million subscribers. So instantly you think of regulatory concerns. But if we back up as to the why, as why this might happen, both of these companies have really been struggling. Earlier this month, Charter lost 61,000 internet subscribers, which with what we were just talking about doesn't sound like a lot. But given a year ago that there was a gain of 105,000 mm -hmm. subscribers, numbers are going in the wrong way. So for two reasons. One, people are cutting the cord. And then second, there's lots of competition from the wireless providers. I have certainly done that my pa myself in the past. Uh, the three largest gained nearly a million subscribers in the fourth quarter. So when you put that together with Charter's loss, you can understand that they're in pain. Now, Altice uh, is one of the largest providers. It's smaller, of course, than Charter, but one of the largest, as you were mentioning, about 5 million subscribers. They're in 21 states. And Patrick Drahi, I hope I'm saying his name correctly, he's made it clear everything is for sale. So this stock right now, as you mentioned, at the highs, it was up 63%, the most since the IPO. And I should have mentioned, to just really understand score the idea of the loss that we had uh, for Charter earlier this month, the stock was down 17 percent, the worst since 2009, the worst day on record. So they're really looking uh, to do something. Do we have an idea yet of what the regulatory situation might be like in terms of overlap, et cetera? Because I know that Charter is trying to really expand into, say, the rural population. Yes, that's true. We don't know, but in, in this current climate, it's very likely that 
that the scrutiny is really going to be very tough because not only that, when you think about this business uh, in terms of the actual business, lots of complaints. I've certainly <laughs> I try to be kind about the complaints, but you know, complaints about high prices and also bad customer service. Uh, so when you think about that sort of from a cable company, no, what? No, no, never, never. <laughs> um, but when you think about those factors, you know, for the end yeah. of the day, the uh, experience of the end user, and then that it would create the biggest, and then right here in New York, it would create total dominance. So, uh, yeah, it's probably not going to fly right through. Investors, though, they seem, obviously, uh, LTS investors seem to be very enthused by this. Yeah. But even charter shares only down a couple of percentage uh, points, which would seem to suggest that people have somewhat okay with it. I mean, if they were really unokay with it, you would see the shares down a lot more. It's probably too early for charter communication uh, investors to really weigh in. Something to think about here is uh, they do, Altis has $25 billion worth of debt, and they also have a corruption scandal in Portugal, which is unlikely to affect numbers for Altis USA, mm. but it's something for people to think about. So at the end of the day, I think that the charter communication investors are going to be thinking about whether or not this potential deal would really bring up the growth in the numbers enough to offset those negatives. All right, Abigail, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Abigail Doodle joining us there. We don't know how far along necessarily they are in the talks too, but I do feel like the idea of, you know, the regulatory climate's quite interesting. You could also yeah. make an argument that announce a deal now and there's wait out the clock yeah. until November and see if the environment changes. I think in terms of antitrust, the one advantage they might have is that we're talking about businesses that are in decline. So maybe they can make an argument to regulators that this is a way to save that. This is a way to help all those right. people out in rural America who don't have broadband, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I don't know, maybe they should just hire me for that. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. Sure. Are you looking? No. Are you, okay. No, I love you, Alex. Why would I go anywhere? He may not be for yeah. sale with that. But, uh, but I think your point of, but how do they measure consumer benefit versus antitrust? Look at Spirit JetBlue. You yeah. can make the argument that they needed to merge in order to compete with the big guys. And without yeah. them, they don't have the pricing power. Yeah. Who's your cable provider? We cut the cord. Okay. We, don't, we, we no longer have it. So you're part of the problem, Alex. I am. I am the problem. <laughs> says my husband every day. Okay, coming up, Jay Woods, Chief Global Strategist over at Freedom Capital Markets, joins us. This is The Close on Bloomberg. This is The Countdown to The Close. Romain Bostic alongside Alex Steele. Ten minutes, Alex, until we get to those closing bells. You missed all of the action last week, Alex, and you're not really getting any here on the first day of the I'm week, but that really could change. Yeah. I know, it could change, yeah. but I'm really not. Volume is a little bit mixed. We're a little bit lower, but I put it in quotes because like down two tenths of one percent feels like nothing. It's going to be a buy the dip kind of scenario. Yeah. Um, and what's leading and what's losing I find interesting. So S&P Energy is the best performing sector. Utilities are one of the worst performing sectors and yeah. for similar is reasons. Is story? No, I think that's a natural gas is up today's story. Uh -huh. So therefore utilities are going to get hit a little bit and uh, oil is up. Therefore, that's good for energy stocks. Why? Because it was cold for like two days this week? or something? Uh, yeah, maybe. I, I never know. understand how those energy prices work. I but, mean, but, I mean, 160, yeah. though, for natural gas. That's a boon for these yeah, guys. Yeah, absolutely. Here. All right. Uh, we are going to talk a little bit more here about what's going on in the commodity space. But as we count down to the close, a focus on stocks and U.S. stocks losing a bit of steam here to start the week. Traders are waiting the big eco data later in the week. And we had a chance to catch up with Jordan Jackson over at J.P. Morgan Asset Management, who's still feeling positive about things. I think there is further upside, and I'm actually pretty bullish. Um, obviously, the markets are keenly focused on the micro, uh, really to kick off the year. And you look no further, uh, the fact that the U.S. tenure is up close to 40 basis points and the market has grinded higher. So clearly, the markets are focused on earnings. Uh, the big names in the index are delivering in earnings, on earnings uh, for, for the most part. And I think now markets are hoping for a bit of a more breath, right, broadening out. That's what we uh, continue to talk about. And I think we will see that play out uh, this year. Jordan Jackson there kicked us off to the close about an hour ago. Here to take us to those closing bells, Jay Woods, chief global strategist over at Freedom Capital Markets, joining us in studio. And Jay, I mean, we're looking at a market. I mean, everyone's going to talk about, oh, we're kind of in this holding pattern right now. This is still an S&P flirting with 5,100, an S&P that's already delivered relatively decent gains on a year-to-date basis. Do you think there's more left in the tank? I do. I don't think it's going to be a straight shot higher. I mm -hmm. think we're going to chop a little while. But uh, any closing high from here on out is an all-time high. That's a positive thing. And uh, like Jordan said ahead of me, I, I agree with him. I think we're going to see a broadening out. And we're starting to see it in industrials, healthcare, and financials minus the regional banks. And that is a good narrative for a healthy bull market. A secular bull market will 
rotate, and uh, we're not seeing all magnificent seven stocks go up. Three of them are flat to down on the year, mm -hmm. and uh, this, this is the sign of a healthy market. Do you think, though, that if we do see that rotation into uh, some of the names, the sectors that you talked about, do you think that's going to be at the expense of tech, meaning people taking profits from that rally and then putting it into those other areas? I actually do. If you go back a week ago Thursday, 10 of 11 S&P select sectors were up. One was down. It was technology. It was the first time that happened since August 2022. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing tech lag in certain aspects of it. The big names continue to skyrocket as we've seen, but they're rotating into names that have been beaten down, have smaller breakouts that have taken a little while to base, and, and I think this is very constructive under the surface. It's not going to make headlines. Uh, you're not going to hear people talk about HCL, HCA Healthcare making new news, uh, new 52-week highs, but to me, that's big news, and that's what I'm looking at. So is the money coming out of tech, or is it going to come from, like, money market funds or the RRP, just like a lot of liquidity still sloshing elsewhere in the market? Well, it's going to come from the sidelines, first of all. There's okay. more, more cash on the sidelines that hasn't been put to work. And then, yes, people want to stay in this market. It has been rewarding investors. And what they're seeing is some pullbacks, like an Apple that mm -hmm. hasn't really done anything this year. And let's see where there are opportunities. And those three sectors I mentioned earlier, industrials, healthcare, financials, so, have those opportunities. Do you think that as we have all the liquidity on the sidelines, does mm -hmm. that eventually run out? And then, event, and then we don't have any more juice to go higher? Well, if and it, what's your time frame for Well, that? if it runs out, then I think we're going to see a nice spike because they're going to be coming running into the market. Um, no, I, I think my time, my, my time horizon is the next 3, 6, 12 months. Uh, you know, the end of the year, election cycle. Seasonally right now, we, we should see a bit of a pullback, a bit of a drag uh, where we're not making new highs consistently like we were. Mm -hmm. That's constructive action underneath the surface. I think at the end of the year, once we get through the noise, and there's going to be a lot of noise, this year, let's be clear. Yeah. Uh, we will see a nice run like we did in the fourth quarter of this year. Maybe not yeah. as significant, but I think we're poised to continue that run and that broadening out theme is what we really want to see if it's going to have legs, and I think it does. I'm curious, though, but for some of the potential impediments, and we talk about this election season, it's a little bit different than past election seasons, and primarily that we, we kind of already know who the two candidates are going to be. There's not a lot of competition, and both are basically known quantities. Obviously, one was a president, and we have the current president here. Mm -hmm. and I I only bring that up because do you think that maybe the volatility we typically get in an election year might be a little bit more smooth given that we're dealing with known quantities? Um Yes, but I don't even know if the known quantities are going to make it to the election site. I don't want to be one of yeah, those yeah, conspiracy yeah. theorists. Gotcha. But I, I think that those headlines that they generate won't really react overall in the market. There will be pockets of volatility. Mm. If the, the Republican uh, Representative Trump is leading, you should see defense stocks starting to rally. Mm. Uh, if it's Biden again, maybe those solar stocks, some of those mm. you know, green energy stocks get a bid again. Yeah, but that trade didn't work out. It didn't uh -huh. work, but what's funny is it, it, as it anticipated into it, mm. energy didn't really work uh, into Trump, but as he got into power uh, 2016, uh, we, we saw them run into it. So the anticipatory names, defense stocks should rally in, in Republican, you know, led, uh, you know, win at the ballot box. We'll see. That's that's what we'll have to watch as we get closer and those poll numbers start to shake out and we have an idea who the nominee and the eventual winner is going to be. Do you have to hedge downside? Um, you always want to be ready for anything. But on no the one seems to be wanting to do that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> there, there aren't a lot of sectors right now that you look at and you go, I want to be short these sectors because they, the, the sectors that have made the downward move are starting to base. You look at that, I'll go back to healthcare. You look at Pfizer and Bristol Myers, those stocks have done nothing for two years. Well, they've done something new. They've stopped going down. They're starting to bottom. To me, I think we're starting to see slow bases starting to form underneath the surface. Uh, so there isn't a sector that I want to stay out of. Uh, but what we've seen, and we saw at Palo Alto Networks, mm -hmm. perfect example, those companies that have done well that haven't guided well, they're going to punish them. They're going to punish them hard. Now, it's made a tremendous comeback. Thank you, Nancy Pelosi, for taking a position in the stock. But the, the stocks that do not perform well, do get beaten down. So you have to be very specific within the sector. But I do think at the end of the year, the tide will lift more boats than normal and we'll get a broadening of that rally. All right, Jay, always great to talk to you. Jay Woods, he's chief global strategist.
over at Freedom Capital Markets, helping us count down to the close, just about three minutes away. Alex, I know you're really enthralled by this market, so you want to walk through the numbers for me? Oh, gosh, <laughs> fine. All right, we're looking at the S&P doing a whole lot of nothing. All right, he's down three-tenths. Oh, wow. So that's something, okay. right? All right. Uh, but you get, I set you up for that. But, but, the tech yeah. is pretty, but tech is pretty much uh, flat. In fairness, though, I mean, we are going to get some potential catalysts this week, obviously with the retail earnings coming out this week, uh, a big PCE report on Thursday, potentially big, I should say, here. And that could really move the market in a similar way that we saw with NVIDIA last week and with the CPI and PPI reports the week prior. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. It just it just feels like it, the, the, the consensus is buy. Yeah, it's going to be re it's really hard for stocks to go down individual yeah. names if you missed for sure that's something different what's going to change that narrative and I, I genuinely don't know all right well we're going to have a full breakdown here of all the market moves on the day and set you up for the big market moves on the week stick with us we're going to take you to the bell and beyond beyond the bell Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now and right now we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romain Bostic alongside Alex Steele. We're counting you down to the closing bell. You heard it'll take us beyond the bell. It's a global simulcast with Scarlet Fu joining us in the TV studio. Carol Masser and Tim Stenevik on Bloomberg Radio. A welcome to all of our audiences across all of our platforms here at Bloomberg. As we count you down to the close, Carol Masser, yeah. not a whole lot of action here on the day, but that could change over the next couple of days. Absolutely. It's jam-packed economic data, right? We're going to get the uh, Fed's preferred inflation. Uh, measure that's a key one but there's lots of them on consumer sentiment Michael McKee was on with us earlier talking about the importance of durable goods and what we get there so we're going to be going through all of that data we have some Fed speakers as well so there's a lot to get through uh, certainly over the next week or so we did find a little bit of action when it came to the price of Bitcoin today I knew you would go there yeah, up five percent today best levels what since 2021 December of 2021 Above 54,000 above 54,000 and uh, that's why those um, crypto related companies are standouts in today's trade MicroStrategy mm -hmm. up at double digits is this all because of MicroStrategy though Scarlett MicroStrategy like, is, is a reflection of Bitcoin yeah but I mean sailor came out and said he bought more so is that why it's up I don't know it's just this can we, can vicious we cycle or virtuous cycle however yeah. depending on the price action chicken like or that. the egg chicken I, or the egg I at think the end people of the day people were bored today right and I just feel like okay let's play around with Bitcoin yeah, well, I mean, that is basically the, the only real action you're seeing in the market, but it gets <laughs> to the broader question right now. I mean, well, at least according to Alex, that and, you know, <laughs> I don't know, her, the pants that she buys from Paris. But we get to this idea. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, pants in Paris? Wait, I know. Wait, wait, we got to talk about that. I mean, we spent like an hour on Bloomberg yeah. TV talking about We did. We did. You can go back and rewatch it. I will go rewatch it. Yeah, Scarlett and I are all over this. Uh, yeah. Scarlett, Scarlett, you're a part of this cabal. Too? I'm, I'm bringing her on. Oh, I'm yeah. bringing her on to the Parisian joining this. Alex having a bad influence on the team here. We'll get back. Back to Alex and her shopping habits in just a second. Let's walk you through the numbers. Uh, with we get the closing bells here in New York. Most of the major indices going to finish the day in the red. The Dow Jones Industrial Average down 62 points or about two tenths of a percent. The S&P down 20 points or about four tenths of a percent. While the Nasdaq Composite is going to close lower by about 21 points or one tenth of a percent. One of the few bright spots out there, at least on the equity side. That's the Russell 2000, outperforming the broader market once again, and maybe that is what you want to see. Jay Woods was just talking about it, a broadening of this rally, a six-tenths of a percent gain on the Russell 2000. All right, yeah, broadening out, right? It does feel like some of that going on in certainly in today's uh, session. Uh, Scarlett, just a quick check on the S&P 500. You had most names to the downside, about 339, 162, though, gaining ground on this uh, Monday. All right, let's take a look at the sector performances. Go to the IMAP, which shows you uh, where you have declines and utilities, which is, of course, one of the small sectors in the S&P 500. The biggest loser is down more than 2%. Uh, communication services, obviously a bigger sector, also down by more than 2%. Real estate investment trust losing more than 1%. On the upside, uh, modest gains really in energy, consumer discretionary, and tech. All right, let's get to some of the individual gainers. Go figure. The number two gainer in the S&P 500. Nothing high tech here, folks. Uh, Domino's Pizza. It was up uh, almost 10% at its highs today. Finishing the day, though, with a gain of about 5.8% here. Fourth quarter, same store sales uh, in the U.S. US, uh, beating expectations, a bugging, a tr a bucking, excuse me, a trend that we've seen among some of the fast food chains. Stock hitting its highest and I think about two years, a little bit more than that, up the most since July. Uh, share price, by the way, is in 
quite a run, up about 40% since the end of October. So uh, some news on, domino, no, uh, news on dominoes. Uh, and then we also had Micron Technology coming out among the top gainers in both the S&P and the NASDAQ 100 on higher volume, uh, now making advanced memory semiconductors for NVIDIA. So this was certainly some eye-popping news. And then one more else I wanted to mention, number one gainer in the S&P 500 and a top gainer in the NASDAQ 100, Palo Alto Networks. Since that 38% drop uh, on earnings last Wednesday, we are seeing investors continue to move into this name and Palo Alto up about 7% in today's session. Hey guys, quick thing here, we got Workday uh, coming out with earnings. It looks pretty solid. Uh, adjusted fourth quarter earnings coming in $1.57 a share. That's beat uh, by about 10 cents. They also are looking uh, at uh, subscription revenue for the full year 2025, which would be this coming year, at the high end of $7.78 billion. They're also looking at a pretty uh, solid inline uh, margin for this year, about 24.5%. They're also looking to buy Hired Score, which just looks like a straight up software company right here uh, in New York. Yeah, the stock it's is HR, down. HR stuff. Is it HR yeah. stuff? Okay. The stock is down more than 2% right now in trading, but it's interesting that you bring up that M&A because there's so many of these enterprise software companies, you wonder at what point uh, more consolidation will start to combine them. Every every earnings season around mm. this time, yeah. we talk through all these enterprise software companies that are small and they're very niche. -y. Yeah, I, would, I can't remember the number, but I remember we were speaking with uh, Anurag Rana and he was giving us the actual total number of these companies that are out there and it was it was an insane number. And, he was basically and they're being saying started every day. That it just has to come, you it know, has to have that yeah. consolidation. It's interesting you say that. We were just speaking with Ann Maletti over at all Spring Global Investments, and she said, we see more M&A on the horizon, especially when it comes to tech companies. She says executives have to get more comfortable that rates are going to be stable and, and where they're going to be, but she expects uh, M&A to pick up in the later part of the year. Hey, I do want to get to some decliners, uh, pretty easy to find some notable decliners today. I do you want to start with big tech name, uh, shares of Alphabet falling more than 4.4% on the day today. This is amid concerns about how it's faring when it comes to generative AI. I don't know if you saw any examples of this over the last few days. People posted it on on uh, Twitter and on X and on threads and wherever people are going these days um, about the <laughs> differences in terms of like asking questions to uh, Alphabet's platform, uh, formerly known as BARD, Gemini. Um, and they addressed some of that last week, but there are concerns. And there was a note from um, an analyst out today that said that um, this poses a risk to its search business, that it's not necessarily getting this right right now. And we saw shares uh, really respond as a result of that. I uh, also want to take a look at shares of Charter Communications, because speaking of M&A, our own Bloomberg team uh, wrote that Charter Communications is exploring uh, a takeover of, of Altice USA, a smaller cable provider. That's according to people with knowledge of the matter. CNBC did report that Altice uh, has not been approached formally at this point. Um, Charter working with financial advisors as it studies the merits of a potential deal for the U.S. broadband and video services provider. Uh, the people said asking not to be identified. Uh, down 2.2% Charter Communications, that is. The shares of Altice did shoot higher on the Bloomberg report. And then Intuitive Machines, ticker LUNR. We talked a lot about this one last week as a result of uh, the, I, I, we can call this a successful moon landing, right? I mean, I think so. I, think I got poo pooed on that successful. earlier today, but I would think so. I, I think so too. And you know what? Shareholders sending shares down thirty four percent. It landed on its side, and that's okay. why I shares mean, are lower know. today. Okay, but the key word there is landed. Right? Exactly. Right. Thank you, thinking. Romaine. Thank you. Um, shares still up two hundred percent from a January low. Did so Carol nod her head in agreement? Decline. Did no. you not? No. I didn't no. see. No. You don't no. think it's successful? I don't she's know. A, she's a former be gymnast. She's, you know, she, she you sticks the land landing. Mark. Okay. Alex is a gymnast. You know that too, yeah. right? Yeah, like 40 years ago. <laughs> All right, but you got to land. <laughs> yes. You got to land your mark. But you have you to stick hold, your landing. You if you land on your side, it doesn't count. But then again, exactly. they're, they're not going for perfect tens. Uh, that's all I'm saying. Um, right. hey, just, We're going to get back yes. to uh, Alex's and uh, Carol's. Uh, gymnastic pass but a zoom <laughs> earnings are answer. out zoom video of course the meme stock darling that at one point was trading at almost six hundred dollars a share at the height of the pandemic now trading at sixty five dollars a share though it is moving higher here and after hours trading earnings crossing the wire a pretty big beat adjusted eps a dollar forty two street on average was looking for a dollar fifteen revenue in the fourth quarter one point one five billion the street on average was looking for one point one three here's your forecast here for the full fiscal year the company sees adjusted eps of 
485 to 488 a share. The street on average was looking for 472. The company says it sees full year revenue of $4.6 billion a share, pretty much in line with what the street was looking for. Also, also authorizing a stock repurchase program of up to 15, 1.5, excuse me, $1.5 billion. Yeah, that's like the cherry on top of uh, what looks to be a fairly uh, decent outlook, especially when it comes to that revenue for the full year of 2025, $4.6 billion. Um, actually, that trails the average analyst estimate. I'm looking at the adjusted EPS. That is higher than expected. $4.85 to $4.88. Analysts were looking for $4.72 for full year EPS. Yeah, the company's founder and CEO, um, Eric Guan, saying in the press release, um, talking about free cash flow, right? Always crucial when you're looking at the balance sheet, saying it's up 24.1% year over year um, to the full fiscal year, uh, about 1.471 billion or so, uh, representing a free cash flow margin of about 32.5%. So um, generating some cash there. He led the press release with uh, the mentioning Zoom AI companion. I, I I, I got to tell I didn't know that there was a generative AI digital assistant for Zoom. Does it seem like everyone is coming out with a generative AI digital yes. assistant? You have to. If yes, you're in 100%. Tech. I mean, yes. uh, so that's aimed at boosting productivity, enhancing team effectiveness, and fostering skill development across the Zoom platform. What does that even mean? I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I need help Zooming. <laughs> I don't know. I'm I mean, curious what that looks like. Maybe they can be you and like you're not actually on Zoom and they can do your meetings for you. I mean, that would be <laughs> that would valuable. Be, but I mean, I think that the, if you just look goose. at the stock, isn't it just, yeah. hey, we're going to do a nice repurchase, therefore stock is up. There we go. Yeah. That's but it. so about the they, generative They're going to create right? people that are us that can do the Zoom. I kind of like that one. All right, guys. That <laughs> that's, is a, that's when everyone says back to the office, everyone back in. <laughs> yeah, it's probably We've not got good a problem. Zoom. We've got a problem. All right, guys. That's a wrap. Our Monday cross-platform radio, TV, YouTube, Bloomberg Originals. We call it Beyond the Bell. We will see you again, same time, same place tomorrow. All right, a lot more coverage coming up here on Bloomberg Television. A closer look at Kroger and Al Albertsons. The FTC here in the U.S. suing to block that $25 billion acquisition. We're going to break down the lawsuit and the impact with the former commissioner of the FTC, William Kovacek. That's coming up next right here on The Close on Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Close. I'm Scarlett Fu with Romaine Bostic. New week, new markets? Maybe, kind of. We have the stock market rally stalling a bit here with the S&P 500 retreating from its record high. The Russell 2000 small caps outperforming today after losing eight-tenths of one percent last week. So they had trailed the broader market last week. A lot of action in the Treasury market insofar as the U.S. government was auctioning off two years and five years. Uh, $62 billion worth of two years, or I should say $63 billion. Decent demand, but uh, for the five years, $64 billion saw a lower bid-to-cover ratio uh, than the average over the last couple of months. Let's take a look at the actual individual movers here, because I wanted to start with Alphabet. A 4.4% decline, it's fairly unusual for a big tech name to fall this much. The last time it dropped this much uh, was back in late January after it came out with results. But Alphabet falling to a seven-week low on concern that missteps in AI, think of uh, what happened to the image generation for its Gemini model, uh, may pose a risk to its search engine business, which is its bread and butter. Kroger's, of course, down 2% as the FTC, along with eight states and Washington, D.C., are suing to block its purchase of Albertsons. And, of course, we'll get into that in a little bit. Palo Alto Networks up 7.3%, the best performer in the Nasdaq 100 and S&P 500, after last week being the biggest decliner for those two indexes. Uh, there was a report that, a disclosure that Nancy Pelosi, former Speaker of the House, bought call options on Pan, uh, Pan W, Palo Alto Networks. And Domino's Pizza uh, rising on earnings almost 6% on the day after fourth quarter comparable sales in the U.S. beat analyst estimates. A bit of a contrast to what we've seen from other fast food chains uh, this earnings season. Romain? All right, earnings still flying across the wire. Zoom earnings just came out a little while ago here. The company beating on several key metrics in the most recent quarter, a dollar, uh, excuse me, $1.15 billion in revenue, a dollar 42 in adjusted EPS and guidance, at least on the bottom line, coming in above street estimates. Michael Turin joining us right now from San Francisco. He's Wells Fargo senior analyst covering this company. He's got an underweight rating on Zoom shares and underweight probably for good reason, Michael. But I am curious when you look at the results today and maybe the potential commentary we get in a, a few minutes here. Any hope here 
then maybe we could yeah. see more material upside. Yeah, I mean, you're characterizing it well. Thanks for having me on. I think the one thing that investors are likely to focus in on most here is the buyback. So we've gotten a lot of questions from investors around what Zoom intends to do with the now $6.5 billion in cash they've built up on the balance sheet. Um, this authorization to repurchase up to $1.5 billion, I think, is something that at least answers one element of uncertainty for investors, which is what does the company intend to do um, with its cash? The other elements of this, the guide looks relatively in line with what we're expecting. We're still low single digits growth. The margins have already been um, so strong that yeah. I, I think it's hard for the company to do much more there. But it's really the buyback that's likely to get the most attention and interest in terms of the call today. But what's the story beyond that buyback? You mentioned the margins. I mean, we're talking about 32% gross yeah. uh, margins, so at least on the free cash flow side. Decent cash flow growth as well. So this is a company still generating yeah. a lot of cash, but are they putting that back into the business in a way where we are going to be talking about that Zoom growth story that was the big narrative in 2020 and 2021? This is something that happened to a lot of software companies. They got stuck between growth and value land, right? I think Zoom's management team still um, thinks of this as a growth-focused company. The challenge is they effectively won their market during COVID, and, and lapping that has been really difficult. So I think they continue to talk about the use of AI um, and transcript capabilities within the technology. They're going to draw more attention around things like phone and contact center, but the core strength and the size and scale of Zoom is still just heavily wedded towards what's happening on the video side. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, we don't see enough in the new product side to offset some of the declines. I think the 2% guide in terms of growth for next year also suggests that we're not in an area where we're really seeing growth meaningfully rebound here. And I do think the management team's bias is to continue to invest towards reinvigorating growth. Um, because in software, that's generally where most of the investor interest comes from. Right. What about reinvigorating growth through acquisitions? Or is that something that yeah. a Zoom wants to avoid, given how um, how much scrutiny there is from the federal government right yeah. now? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the regulatory question is a good one. I think in, in, in telco um, in some of the surrounding markets, deals have just taken a very long time. Um, you know, we've mentioned Zoom has the six and a half billion on the balance sheet that is meaningful. And I, I think in many ways could get them out of this sort of stuck in the mud profile. But we've seen those conversations come and go with five nine. Previously, I think investors would like to see them acquire something in the surrounding communication space. So something like contact center, uh, we think makes sense because it's something that a lot of their customers have that's a higher spend profile. Um, but the, uh, the announcement of the buyback without management commentary at this point would seem to push back on that use of cash and mm. suggest they're going to continue to attempt to go through this standalone. Right. I hear what you're saying. At the end of the day, um, despite the pandemic being a big supercharging event for the company, is Zoom kind of destined to be a utility tech company rather than a high-flying growthy tech company? I mean, that is that is our view, for better or for worse. And we can appreciate that they ran into some unprecedented circumstances here. The gift of subscription revenue has been it's very predictable and you capture the revenue more methodically over a long period of time. You know, what we saw in COVID is really unprecedented and it just makes it really tough for this company to find the next hit that's big enough to truly get this back into growth mode. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Michael, really appreciate your joining us today and giving us the instant yeah. analysis uh, to Zoom's earnings. Michael Wells Fargo's Michael Turin joining us. And of course, Zoom shares right now moving higher in after hours trade. We'll be bringing you details uh, when we get them from the earnings call. Of course, no matter how Zoom fared this last quarter, the video conferencing company may be losing some customers going forward. Work from home falling out of favor with employers and layoffs are more likely to hit remote workers. Here with more now is Bloomberg's Claire Ballantyne. So what exactly, Claire, does the data show when it comes to whether fully remote staff are more vulnerable to uh, job layoffs than those who go into the office? Yeah, so early days and definitely depends on the industry, but some data, at least right now, does show that fully remote workers are more vulnerable to layoffs than those that are hybrid or in person full time. Now, we're just starting to see, you know, lots more white collar employers layoff workers, and we've seen sort of the power shift back to employers from employees. So it's still kind of playing out, but at least right now, it, it seems like going in the office, at least some of the time, is beneficial for you.
uh, beneficial for you? Does that sort of go across all the entire spectrum of employees? I know there's been a lot of talk that maybe if you're a newer employee, somebody trying to work their way up, you need to have some face time. And of course, you know, I feel like every boss is, you know, putting these sort of oh, back to work edicts from their, you know, second or third homes out in Aspen or somewhere. Yeah, it depends yeah. on the company for sure. But definitely the entry level employees, those that are trying to build goodwill, um, are required to go in more in many cases. And career coaches that I've talked to have said, you know, if you're worried about your job or if you're even just trying to get ahead in your job, you're an entry level employee, going in the office is really crucial. But I mean, of course, you know, I mean, we're talking about this in the context of Zoom and there's been so much anecdotal evidence of people who've been called back to work and they go sit at their desk and they just end up on a Zoom call with the workers who aren't in the office that particular day. And a lot of them scratch their head and like, why am I here? I could have done this from home. Yeah, it's a real challenge for employers, I think, because, you know, a lot of places are moving towards the hybrid model. But when you do that, then you have some people here, some people there, people working in other offices around the world. So I think we're still sort of seeing it play out. But there definitely is some frustration with that. And I think that's why a lot of um, hybrid workers are a little frustrated right now. Can you give us a picture of what it looks like here in the U.S. versus the rest of the world? Um, I, I, my understanding is in the U.S. there's a lot more resistance to going back into the office, in part because of the long commutes and the costs and everything else. But has that movement to go back to the office picked up steam overseas more so than here in the U.S.? It definitely depends on sort of the cultural landscape of things. And we know in the U.S. it is so expensive in many cases to commute. Um, you know, just in, in New York, people can commute up to two hours. And that takes away from times with their family. Yeah. So people are still kind of balancing that, I think. And what you've noticed in your story as well is that this shift away from remote work is forcing people to actually move residences, right? They're picking up from where they have been the last couple of years and moving somewhere maybe a little bit closer to the office and sometimes also more expensive. Yeah, it's an entire lifestyle change in some cases. I mean, you know, if you go in twice a week and you have an hour and a half commute, you know, that's one thing. If you're going in four or five days a week and you're doing that every day, it's very different. So people are sort of adapting to that as well. All right, Claire Ballantyne, uh, Culp's, uh, I guess, what are you, like our work from homes are now? Uh, <laughs> although you have to actually come into the office to do that job, which is kind of mm, ironic. Yeah. But nevertheless, we thank you for your service. Uh, all right, Zoom shares, we should point out, too, uh, still holding on to some of the big gains, 10% uh, uh, up here in after hours trading. And you nailed it, right? The frustration is when you're in the office and you have to get on a Zoom call and yeah. with people who are sometimes at home or also even in the office. They're just yeah. sitting in a different part of the office and working on something else at the same time. And this is one reason why I think some of the gloom and doom over like Zoom and, and whether and their competitors, mm. the idea that we're not going to use them as much because we're coming back in, but the world has just changed, right? So even if you're here, there's been, there was some great reporting over the weekend uh, out of the New York Times about uh, business uh, business travel and how yeah. that's kind of gotten consolidated, right? People aren't doing the same amount yes. of trips yes. that they used to. They're still traveling, but not necessarily as frequently. So a lot of stuff still needs to be done uh, over teleconferences. Yeah, that's like a really that. great point. Yeah. Um, I talked to a couple of people when I was in San Francisco last week who said just that. They're not traveling for business at all because everyone would rather gather on Zoom. Speaking of San Francisco. Is there anyone left in San Francisco? That's what I was going to get yeah. to. Downtown okay. was fairly empty. Yeah. Um, but then you go into the suburbs, everyone's everywhere. I mean, the suburbs have had a revitalization yeah. completely. Yeah, because they can Zoom in. Yeah, from, but but yeah. you know what? For the Warriors game, everyone came into town. For so. the town <laughs> and then left as soon as the sun went down. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's just the start of oh, it. Oh, San right. Francisco. Coming up, we've got the top three, where we focus in on the top three movers and shakers at the center of the day's biggest stories. That's next. This is The Close on Bloomberg. It's time now for the top three. Every day at this time, we take a deep dive into the people at the center of the day's top stories. And first up is Ronna McDaniel. The chairwoman of the RNC is stepping down after weeks of pressure from former President Donald Trump. In addition to losing her, his favor, Romain, she oversaw a string of losses in recent elections and some pretty ho-hum fundraising figures. All right, is that going to improve now? Well, I mean, if Trump gets uh, Michael Watley, who has the North Carolina Republican Party and his daughter-in-law, Lara Trump, to be co-chairs, as he's been pushing for, 
maybe it does. I mean, he's he's going to make the calls. All right, one to watch there, one that I'm keeping an eye on, and one of the most read stories on the Bloomberg Terminal today is about Jane Frazier and her poaching a key executive from J.P. Morgan. Avishwash Raghavan is leaving J.P. Morgan to join Citigroup to lead that newly formed banking revision. And if you remember, Scarlett, Jane Frazier completely upended yep. this company, reorganized it, and then one sort of piece that was missing was who was going to head this new banking unit. And this is a pretty sprawling unit. This is a huge role for him. Of course, he did kind of the same job at J.P. Morgan, though, with primarily a focus over overseas. Mm -hmm. This is going to be a much more of a global position. And more importantly, he reports directly to the only person that matters, and that's Jane Frazier. Yeah, that's a really important point yeah. because um, at J.P. Morgan last month, he was just promoted to be the sole head of investment banking. But even then, there were several layers yes. between him and Jamie Dimon, the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase. Yeah. This is, you know, really eliminating all of that. He can go straight to Frazier. Yeah, and I'm always intrigued by these sort of, uh, you know, when one, one big company mm -hmm. pitches a, a big executive from one of their rivals here. Of course, J.P. Morgan was quick to elevate a couple of folks there to fill uh, to fill Avisha's shoes. But uh, this is a big loss for J.P. Morgan. Morgan and a big gain for Jane Frazier. Yeah, saying. but he's got his work cut out for him, right? Because Citi's banking division is the smallest of its five businesses, and yeah. its revenue was down 15% from a year ago. So Yeah, well, hopefully he can change that. All right, let's move on to the third person we're watching, and that is Kathy Wood. Her firm sold shares of TSMC for the first time in more than two years. Overall, Wood is trimming her holdings in the global chip bellwethers as the AI frenzy intensifies. You have now both TSMC and NVIDIA dropping out of the top 10 holdings of her ARC autonomous tech and robotics ETF. Yeah, I'm kind of intrigued by this. I remember there was a lot of criticism of her for not having a position in NVIDIA when the stock was going through. I mean, in fact, she sold it kind of before it really took off there. But she kind of made this case repeatedly that she was looking at kind of the next right. generation yeah. of generative AI companies. And there are a sprinkling of those in uh, her holdings if you go through her various ARC holdings here. But still, it's kind of curious that you don't have the granddaddy of them all right there, NVIDIA. And now, of course, TSMC, which most people think is also going to be a big Yeah, company. no, that's a good point. I mean, yeah. it's not like she's making a fundamental change in her stance no, on no, AI no, at no, all. This no. is just more to get her no. portfolio weightings in line. No. But um, she has been criticized, like you said, for yeah. missing out on that big rally. And in her fairness, she did cite value at the mm -hmm. time, saying that it had already sort of had the big pop and, and valuation now. Others even. And, you know, I mean, she's probably right, right? I mean, I think we all look at NVIDIA and know that something's amiss there. So uh, maybe this proves to be present uh, down the line. All right, a lot more coverage coming up, including when we return a look back on this day in history and the creation of the web browser, Scarlett. And we're going to leave you with a question before we go to break. What percentage share of the web browser market does hmm. Google currently hold? Pretty big. That number? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to give you a more detailed response when we come back after the break. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> 31 years ago today, British computer scientist Tim Berners-Lee gave a public presentation on the basic architecture for searching the Internet. At the time, the Internet was largely a text-based gated community used only by government agencies, universities, research institutions. This new web browser, though, originally named World Wide Web and later changed to Nexus for obvious reasons, it really revolutionized the main protocols that you use on the Internet. In layman's terms, what Berners-Lee set was a public domain specification, think HTTP, HTML. It created a portal that could be easily used in search by anyone, well, almost anyone. In his 1999 book called Weaving the Web, Berners-Lee highlighted the critical role of the next computer workstations that Steve Jobs developed after he was ousted from Apple. Now, next workstations initially were the only ones really capable of handling this new coding protocol. But that would change, and fast. Within two years, programmer Mark Andreessen, while working at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, helped introduce Mosaic, one of the first web browsers to display images. Andreessen would leave that center to create what would become Netscape Navigator, which would, by the mid-1990s, become the most popular web browser available. Other notable browsers popped up around this time, including Opera and Microsoft's Internet Explorer. Microsoft, taking a no-holds-barred approach to pre-installed pre Explorer on machines running Windows. It was a strategy that allowed Explorer to grab a 95% share of the browser market by 2003. But that also grabbed the attention of regulators who made that browser strategy central to an antitrust case against the company. Now, eventually, Microsoft did meet its match, but not from the government. Apple came along with Safari. Netscape, which withered under Microsoft's dominance, was sort of revived as Firefox. And Google, in 2008, would unleash Chrome. 
Within 10 years, Chrome had attained more than 70% of the market share for web browsers. And as of today, it still holds 64% of the market share, according to data compiled by StatCounter. Now, though, Alphabet finds itself in the same position that Microsoft found itself in just a few decades ago. In a trial that took place back in November, U.S. antitrust enforcers argued that Google built a search monopoly through exclusivity payments to smartphone makers and wireless carriers. And while a ruling in that trial isn't expected for months, it may not even matter. The browser slash search wars, they've already entered a new phase as AI and chatbots completely remake the landscape in a way that depending on who you ask, will create a broader and more equitable slate of browser or simply give rise to a new 800 pound gorilla in the search domain. Scarlett. And that is why all these concerns about uh, Alphabet's steps in AI with the pause of image generation for the Gemini model is raising concerns about what happens with uh, its search engine as well. All right, I just want to step away for a moment because we do have other earnings. iRobot reported results. This is the maker of the Roomba vacuum cleaner, the one that slides around that cats like to sit on or people like to put their cats on. Uh, of course, it's not moving forward with the sale to Amazon. Uh, so there are not a lot of analyst estimates on the earnings here, but it did report an adjusted loss uh, in the fourth quarter of $1.82 and uh, revenue in the fourth quarter of $307.5 million. Analysts were looking for, two analysts were looking for $308 million in revenue for the fourth quarter. For the full year, uh, iRobot sees 2024 adjusted loss per share of $3.30 to $3.73 uh, and 2024 revenue of $825 million to $865. The consensus was $865 million. The stock surging at the moment up 20% in after hours trade. All right, let's move on here because we, of course, have been talking about the M&A uh, landscape and what's been going on with Kroger's and Albertsons. It turns out the U.S. Federal Trade Commission, eight states and Washington, D.C., are combining to sue to block that acquisition, the $24.6 billion acquisition by Kroger's of Albertsons. The argument is that the combination would lead to lower wages for workers and higher prices for groceries. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Leah Nyland. Leah, normally in this kind of instance, the companies offer some kind of a concession. That's been offered and the reception was not good. Yeah, so Kroger and Albertsons offered to divest as many as 413 stores to CNS, which is primarily a wholesaler, but they do own the Piggly Wiggly franchise and they operate about 23 stores themselves. The FTC said that they were very concerned about this proposed divestiture because there's been a history of failures in the supermarket industry when uh, bigger brands like Albertsons sell off stores to smaller ones. Um, in 2015, when Albertsons bought Safeway, they sold off a bunch of stores to a small retailer by the name of Hoggins. Hoggins ended up going into bankruptcy just a few months later, and then Albertsons ended up buying back most of the stores that it had sold to Hoggins for just pennies on the dollar. Is there any sense here that these companies can do something that would actually placate the plaintiffs in this case? So when these cases go to trial, they're no longer really looking to play, uh, placate the plaintiff. They're looking to placate the judge. And that can end up being... Um, uh, easier, actually, than the regulators. We've seen that in some recent cases, for example, Microsoft Activision, where they were able to persuade a judge that the um, conditions that they had offered to the other companies really did resolve some of the competitive concerns. So we'll really be looking for Kroger and Albertsons to persuade the judge who's assigned on this that the divestiture package that they made is really um, a good enough one um, and that the FTC's complaints um, can be resolved by it. All right, Leah Nyland there, a nice uh, look here uh, at the latest filing. A lawsuit, of course, to block that Kroger-Albertson's deal. We want to continue that conversation right now and get some more insights out of Bill Kovacic. He's professor of law over at George Washington University's Law School. He's also a former member uh, and chair of the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, he has also had a long, long career here dealing with competition policy, including as non-executive director with the U.K.'s Competition and Markets Authority. Uh, Bill, I I'm going to kind of pose the same question that I just posed to Leah here. Because this is a company, the two companies, I should say, have made it clear that they are willing to divest a certain amount of stores, a couple of brands, at least for right now, that doesn't seem to be enough to satisfy these states. Is there anything more they can do short of effectively just completely blowing up this company? I don't think there's much they can do. I think Leah got it just right. The real focus here and the path to success is to persuade the judge that the deal is good enough to solve the competitive problems. And Recent decisions in the courts going back two years have cleared a path for them to do that. It's brought the best settlement proposal forward 
and encourage courts to take that into account in evaluating whether or not there have been adverse competitive effects. So the idea that you can argue the adequacy of the best offer is now well established in recent cases, and that's the best chance they have to succeed. Uh, how, when you look at the, com the complexion of this lawsuit, the idea multiple states, the federal government, and the fact that this is a deal that was officially announced well over a year ago, late 2022, you're now getting into kind of a cost-benefit analysis for Kroger and Albertsons of continuing to try to see this through. Do you see an advantage to doing that? The test for the companies is how badly they want it. Uh, Microsoft Activision showed that if you regard the transaction as especially valuable, that it does put you in a better position to compete effectively in the future, and you're willing to spend a lot of money and take a lot of time getting to the finish line, that you can ultimately accomplish the transactions. But it requires a very shrewd judgment by the companies about whether it's worth it, because it does take a lot of time, it is expensive, but earlier deals have shown that you can find a path to the goal. So the White House, through the DOJ and through the FTC, has been pushing back against all kinds of deals in different sectors. Uh, you have it obviously with Campbell and Savos. You have it with JetBlue and Spirit. In this instance, you have eight states along with Washington, D.C., as part of the FTC's lawsuit. Does that strengthen the government's case? I think it helps the public agencies to have the broader coalition of states along with them. And of course, the states of Washington and Colorado have brought their own cases under state antitrust law in both of those jurisdictions. It's an advantage uh, also in that it helps you gather more facts at the local level that provides a bit of additional argument support for your arguments. So it is an advantage to have the larger coalition with mm. you. OK. Leah was telling us earlier about um, the Safeway purchase uh, by Albertsons and how that didn't work out for consumers because it ended up shutting down stores and the company went bankrupt. To what extent the, can the FTC refer to that instance as why it, it, the, the judge should not allow this deal to go through? They'll do that for a certainty, and they won't just point to that transaction. They'll go back through a database of retail divestitures that go back into the 1990s and the FTC will summon up every bad experience that they've had. Uh, it's a little bit awkward to go back through your failed divestitures because you put your stamp on those in the past, mm -hmm. but I think the FTC will be willing here to go back and recite each instance in which in the grocery sector, a divestiture package failed to produce the desired results right. at the cost of showing that it made bad choices. From what you've seen, Bill, what is the most effective argument that Kroger can make then? I think the best argument is that uh, the agencies underestimate the value of the transaction, that one, there are real benefits to the consolidation, two, that the competitive solution that they offer by way of a divestiture will be effective, and three, let's take a look at all of the enterprises that have entered the grocery store sector in the last 20 years to provide additional competition. All of that is a way of telling the judge the FTC has underestimated the competitive constraints and it undervalues the benefits of the divestiture package that we put forward. Is that, though, really a legal issue that should be settled in the courts? Mm -hmm. or is that something that really should fall back on regulators and, for that matter, potentially even Congress? Uh, Congress has given strong signals to the agency to bring this kind of case. Uh, the fan base uh, that supports aggressive enforcement has been on this right away. Congress arguably is concerned with rises in food prices. So the, the encouragement for greater activism is, is, is unmistakable, I think, from both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, the real question for the judge is going to be the judge's own intuition about whether the solutions that the parties have offered uh, are good enough. All right, Bill Kovacic, thank you so much for joining us. Professor of Law at George Washington University Law School, uh, giving us some insight here on the uh, lawsuit against the Kroger deal for Albertsons. Let's take a look at how markets closed on the day, because after finishing last week at record highs, the S&P 500 in the red, losing about 19 points remain, but still edging towards 5,100 and, of course, uh, some big gains for the last six months. Yeah, this might be a bit of consolidation, particularly on a day where we had at least uh, three uh, major uh, financial companies actually raise their year-end mm -hmm. price targets uh, for their 12 months price targets, I should say, uh, for the S&P 500. So a lot of folks right now, even though the average target is well below that 5,000 level, you're now starting to piece 
see people bump it back up to 5,100 and beyond. Yeah, but nevertheless, a stalling of the rally, and maybe we'll see a continued stalling until we get that PCE data point on Thursday, which uh, should be something that everyone's keying off of as a catalyst. Uh, you see Treasuries moving lower, two big auctions today, another big auction tomorrow as investors figure out whether uh, the market can digest all those extra treasuries. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Macy's so far now, so the holiday season was strong, right? We had a very strong holiday season, earnings growth of 33%, but those are already expected to drop to 12.9% for the first quarter. To date, we've been receiving more negative guidance from retailers. We've received 18 negative pre-announcements yeah. and only two positive. And that was Jerome Martis of the London Stock Exchange Group sharing her thoughts about Macy's before tomorrow's quarterly earnings uh, that comes out before the bell. Now, analysts expect the U.S. retailer to report a drop in revenue and comparable sales, and investors will be listening for more about the potential buyout interest from Arc House Brigade Group, uh, of course, that joint group. Joining us now for a preview is Zachary Waring. He is equity analyst at CFRA, and Zach has a buy rating on Macy's. How much is the earnings report kind of secondary to whatever Macy's says about uh, the potential acquisition? Yeah, I mean, that's obviously big for them. Um, but, you know, we think the, the full year guidance is probably the bigger mover for the stock. Um, you know, shares trade at a reasonable valuation at about six and a half times. And, um, you know, if if earnings hold up and they have decent guidance, I think the shares can go higher. What's the growth story here for Macy's? Is there one? There really isn't a growth story. So, you know, my recommendation is more on valuation. Um, you know, sales are back below pre-pandemic levels um, and they continue to trend downward. Uh, and so, and almost every metric is back below pre-pandemic levels. So, you know, revenues back below 2019 levels, earnings back below 2019 levels, um, margins below 2019 levels. So um, it's not really a growth story anymore. You know, it's more of a valuation call for us. Um, you know, Dillard's reported a, a little while ago um, they had a strong quarter. Dillard's is a little bit different. Um, their fleet's a little smaller, um, and they buy back a lot of shares. So that's, um, you know, Dillard's is a little different. But um, we think yeah. it'll kind of be in line with that. Dillard saw sales down about 5%. Right. Um, we think mid to low single or mid to high single digit sales decline for the year. Well, well I'm, I'm glad you brought up Dillard's because I was looking at that earlier. You talk about a 5% decline in uh, same source sales here, but you still actually had a pretty big beat on the bottom line here. And I'm curious, what can we read into that? Is there, even if the revenue growth isn't there, is there, for Macy's that is, is there something to be said about cutting costs and I guess right sizing in a way that at least improves the bottom line? Yes, there is. So Dillard's, I think, is a little different because of how many shares they buy back. So they've they've more than cut their uh, shares in half over the last five to seven years, uh, um, and they continue to buy back shares uh, really aggressively. Um, and so I think that has a lot to do with how you know their EPS numbers continue to you know generate you know pretty beat expectations pretty handily. Mm -hmm. Macy's is different. So Macy's doesn't buy back as many shares. They do have a small dividend, um, but you know. We think that they've kind of cut costs the, as much as they can. You yeah. know, they're a retailer. They don't have, you know, their their online presence is much lower than it was during COVID. Um, it's dropped back down to a, no, a more normal level. Um, and so, you know, we think there's probably not much room in terms of margins. Mm -hmm. You know, 6% is kind of where they've been long term. Yeah. So we think it's that's kind of best case scenario for them. Uh, I do want to talk about some of the activists that have been circling in this company. Obviously, Arc House, uh, that's sort of the latest group here. Uh, we interviewed the head of Arc House uh, last week and it was pretty clear here they're much more interested in the real estate assets and what kind of value they can unlock by jettisoning or at least separating uh, the real estate from the retail here. Let's assume for a second they're not successful. They don't get those nine board seats they're looking for here. Do you think Macy's will still take a closer look at the real estate side of this business and maybe find a way to reduce its footprint, spin off a couple of those locations, and maybe find a leaner future for this company? 
Yes, I, I mean, I think they, they will. Um, so that right now they've started a, a small, I think they've got 15 small stores is what they're calling them. So they're, um, you know, much smaller stores and they're, um, you know, in, in cities, metropolitan areas. Um, and they plan to open more. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what they say tomorrow about how that's going. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, they're one of few retailers that owns a lot of their real estate. Um, and I think there is some value there. Um, and obviously their balance sheet's in a really good position. It's improved over the last three or four years. Um, inventory's in a good place. So um, they could potentially sell some real estate to you know reinvest into the business and maybe try some of these different avenues that they've been looking at in recent years. All right, Zach, uh, great to catch up with you. Uh, Zach Warren there, equity analyst over at CFRA. A preview of Macy's, those results expected to hit the tape early uh, tomorrow uh, before the market opens here. Expectations are for about $8.1 billion in sales, $1.99 in adjusted EPS. That would be a drop on a quarter-to-quarter -quarter basis, no matter how you look at it. All right, stick with us here. We're going to set you up for some of the other potential big market-moving events over the next 24 hours. That's coming up next here on The Close on Bloomberg. All right, still a lot of earnings out there, Scarlett, that we have to get to. Expecting earnings out of Cava tomorrow after the bell. The Mediterranean, fa Mediterranean fast casual franchise uh, set to report, well, we hope is going to be earnings. Let's see what <laughs> Bailey Lipschultz thinks, who covers uh, stocks for us here at Bloomberg. Are we expected to get actual earnings out of We're it? expected to get yeah. results. They yeah. were up 130% yeah. from that IPO, so it does seem like kind of the whole sales pitch from management about growing same-store sales. Uh, according to analysts, looks like it's going to be on deck again. This is their third quarterly report since going public back in June. Uh, one of the first companies really to raise a sizable amount of money. And there was so much excitement around this. A lot. I mean, yeah, I have a family member who oh, he eats kava like every single day. Really? And all I did was like call me about this thing. Right <laughs> Is there a preferred protein? <laughs> I haven't been yet. I don't know. You have to ask him. I'll call him tonight. It's my brother. Well, I'm I'm, my question is, is Ozempic a good thing or a bad thing for a company like kava? Well, we saw the William Blair survey that basically said uh, companies like kava, sweet green are actually not going to kind of fall to the Ozempic effect, maybe to the degree that a McDonald's or a Shake Shack would obviously if you're injecting yourself with shots not eating as much food maybe you are going to eat healthier yeah. but the big thing with kava alongside chipotle is the kind of premium proteins and the ability to kind of encourage consumers to trade up yeah. so that's going to be one thing to keep an eye on and of course you cover ipos for us and this was a much heralded ipo which got people enthusiastic about new issues um what are we looking for in terms of uh what kinds of companies will be seeing whether kava can deliver to decide whether maybe they want to go public. Well, Kava at the time last summer was really kind of seen as a potential bellwether for the restaurant phase. We've mm. seen that kind of shift to the background. Now all eyes really are on Reddit and whether or not that can be one of the few technology companies not yet generating on an annual basis a profit, whether they can kind of encourage investors to come kind of step back to the plate. But we saw Reddit in that filing saying that they're going to sell shares to some of their most uh, active users. So it'll be yeah. interesting how that plays out. Yeah, and it's also interesting to see all the threads on Reddit. It, uh, kind of poo-pooing that. Bailey Lipschultz uh, all over this for us here, keeping an eye uh, potentially on those results out of Kava tomorrow after mm. the bell. And quite a few, uh, and we're actually going to get a chance to sit down with the CEO of Kava, Brett Shulman, on Wednesday, who will talk about those results. Meanwhile, over the next 24 hours, a lot to get to, including the WTO conference, I know something, Scarlett, you've been keeping a close eye on. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's the 13th ministerial conference in Abu Dhabi. It continues through Thursday. Mm -hmm. And one thing that's already come out is this idea that the trade volume, global trade volume, may not reach uh, the WTO's own growth estimate of 3.3% in 2024. Yeah. Um, you know, the deglobalization that's taking place kind of hitting his momentum. All right. And in the world of politics, uh, believe it or not, we have another primary, this time in Michigan, both the Republican and Democratic primaries. Not sure. Is going to be any real surprises there? We kind of I know. I think going who the forward, there won't be any are. surprises uh, when it comes to primaries. But we do get some economic data that could be a surprise, right? Right. We've got durable goods at 8:30 a.m., but those are notoriously volatile. We also get consumer confidence at 10 a.m., which will be interesting insofar as what 
investors and consumers say about what they see as inflation, uh, what it looks like going forward. And I feel like this is going to become more important now because yeah. we've gotten past the hard data. This is really about how people feel. Expectations. And how, exactly. We're also going to get a lot of earnings, including from Norwegian Cruise Lines, Lowe's, and we were just talking about Macy's, a few others as well. Yeah, Macy's. And whatever they say about their M&A strategy or whether they're going to uh, succumb to the uh, imitations from activist investors. eBay, Beyond Meat, Kava, Vizio also on tap as well. Join us tomorrow for full market coverage, as always, right here on The Close on Bloomberg.